six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, your husband would get into these drunken stupors and yeah. he would start running his mouth and yeah. tell you everything he knew. Yeah. Um, what did you find was uh, some of the most stunning revelations that, uh, that came? Um, I, besides the, the fact that he admitted he couldn't be a Christian and was an existentialist and explaining what existentialism meant to him, which was startling to me, um, the, the other uh, parts of some of the things he told me, which, which really startled me and frightened me, was his attitude towards murder, which he said was not murder, because he said uh, emotions are not involved. Mm. Um, his, his cold, calculating view of the destruction of, of innocent human beings meaning nothing to him, having mm -hmm. absolutely no, um, no feelings about ordering others to do that. Now, did he ever carry out some of these murders himself, do you think? Oh, of course, yeah. Um, in fact, he told me about Malcolm Kerr's murder. Malcolm Kerr, who's that? Malcolm Kerr was a British double agent who, was, who worked in California. He was uh, one of these joint, uh, these intelligence operatives who worked for both sides. Okay. And he had been in California, but he was um, doing intelligence work in Beirut undercover. He was the head of the American University of Beirut, AUB, which is in um, Lebanon. Okay. Now, my husband was the liaison between the White House and President Jamal, the, the second, the brother of the first president who was murdered. Mm -hmm. um, my husband was involved with assassinations and operations. Okay. He was very upset with Malcolm Kerr because Malcolm Kerr refused, although they were already there, the Marine snipers, the assassins, who were under my husband and General Joy, and uh, Al Gray, of course, were hiding in the, in the dormitory at this university. And, of course, General Gray, General Krulak, General Wilhelm, now Charlie Wilhelm was there. He is now my husband's special boss. And they were undercover there, and they had Malcolm Kerr murdered, simply because Malcolm Kerr would not allow the Marines to stay in the dormitory. Had I been Malcolm Kerr, I wouldn't have wanted uh, rowdy Marine assassins living in a dormitory with um, children, essentially, adolescent young children having set, you know, with their perversion and some of their, their behaviors. So he was, he was put away for that very reason, George told me. The, then there was um, did you, did Dale Did he give you Dorman. any uh, details about how he was killed? Um, no, he, he told me that he had to be gotten rid of because of that. He then said that, and oh, this is interesting, Mary Clark Yost Halab is, my husband is handled by her. She is a, an American double agent who was put on my husband's case because she could handle him. They had an affair, well, of course, while my husband was first married. Um, I found out about it because she called the house after we were married and wanted to talk to him. And I found in his papers a photograph of her and her bio and all kinds of information on her. And her address 
in his address book. And I have, I want you all to see that on, in this movie. I, okay. I have a photograph of her. They had a long-term affair um, the whole time he was in Beirut while she was married to an Arab intelligence double agent who was underneath Malcolm Kerr. Okay. And who took over when Malcolm Kerr was murdered by them. So what you have here is a favor essentially done to Yost. She was Yost. She's from Louisiana. She, Baton Rouge, uh, New Orleans. How did she enter the intelligence picture? Was she recruited well, from school? She, yeah, she was at, um, um, trying to think. I, I have her bio. Um, Okay. English major, uh, written books on British literature, um, Phi Beta Kappa. Um, she went to the American University in Beirut. She married a, an administrator there who became, because of her position, you know, they love the mixed marriages. Um, he was Mixed second marriage in the sense of? For the double agents. If you marry... If an agent marries an agent of from another, another country, yeah, yeah. They, they love that. The uh, intelligence community love that. The State Department loves that. And I was mentioning um, earlier that about the State Department, uh, when I was living with Sarah McClendon, helping her um, in, in 1986, I went everywhere she went because she's the senior national uh, White House correspondent. And I went to the State Department one day because I was curious about why there isn't peace in the Middle East. And I wanted to go to what I thought was the Middle East Department. Well, I, there was a group of students and I got a, a press pass ostensibly to go in and mm -hmm. interview them. So I left them and f meandered up to the uh, Near East section. Mm -hmm. And I had quite a few hours. I thought they were going to, you know, say, what are you doing here? Because all the doors were open. They had these little um, buttons on each door, you know, that they could have closed and you could have had to have known somebody to get in, which I think is terrible, to have the American people not know and not be allowed into the State Department without a special Sarah McClendon. If I hadn't had been living with the senior White House correspondent, I, as a citizen, would not be welcome at the State Department. Now, if they're interested in peace and they're interested in, in that kind of thing, they're certainly not showing it by the closed-door policy. Mm -hmm. So I went in. There were about, oh, eight or ten offices. I went in every single one. I was looking to find out who the um, leaders were. I knew about Aaron David Miller. I knew about um, David Satterfield, who really wasn't David Satterfield. His family were uh, Zionist, who changed their name, to David Satterfield, who was a Virginian uh, senator mm -hmm. back in the 30s, who had a wonderful name. It's like Jonathan Pollard. He took the name Pollard, which wasn't his name because of Governor Pollard. I was married to Governor Pollard's grandson for 21 years. They, they take the names of honorable people, and then they're not honorable. And, and what was his name previous to Senator Hoyle? He lived, um, uh, now Aaron David Miller, I think that is possibly his name. It might have been Mule. And I'm not saying that just mm -hmm. because they changed the name, they're bad. Right. Um, but what I am saying, that there is this idea that go ahead and change it and be somebody else, kind of a snake, you know, uh -huh. changing colors for the moment, not being honorable and truthful. Um, saying my family is Rosinski. Heck, I'd be Rosinski. You know, I'm, I'm the eighth Catherine in a row from Scotland. It's ridiculous. Uh, but my daughter's Catherine and my granddaughter's Catherine. We're just, you know, it's a family tradition. Weird. Mm -hmm. But we're happy with that. Um, so um, David Satterfield, the reason I went there was because in the spring I went to an, uh, a dinner it was either a dinner or a luncheon that the um, World Affairs Council had in, in Norfolk. And 
he was speaking. Mm -hmm. And I'm very interested in peace because as a Christian, sure. I want it. I know it's possible if people are reasonable. And this talk that, that uh, David Satterfield gave, there were probably 20 mentions of Israel to one of the Palestinians. He was extremely biased, arrogant. The arrogance is what bothers me because you can't have peace, you can't have justice where there's imbalance. Um, and even that comes from the Greek furies, you know, the, the, the female who holds the, the, the justice. Women understand balance and justice. And women know, mothers know, if you show favoritism towards one child, the house is, that, that child, the other child's not going to be normal the rest mm. of its life. So a wise mother is, is fair and tries to be balanced, as most families do that are, that are balanced. Well, after having heard the bias and so forth, and then seeing other people who were involved at the State Department in Norway when I was there, when my husband was doing some weapons deals with, with um, um, uh, Newt Igum and some of the State Department people under the table when we were supposedly going to Moss for the mayor and her husband and George were doing some deals. He's, a, he's sort of a pilot and, you know, there's a lot going on between Norfolk, Virginia Beach and Norway and weapons deals and so forth now because of what they set up in the spring of 95. So I went into the State Department um, Near East section and found there was not one single Palestinian, not one single um, Muslim, religious, uh, Saudi, you know, Jordanian, not one Christian Protestant, mm -hmm. not one Roman Catholic, not one plain old American, whatever, from Corn Pone. Every single person in all of those offices were either Zionist, Israelis, whatever, and they had pictures all over the wall of Israel, Israel, Israel. They had magazines, Israel Today. You know, I was given a copy of one. Um, and there were yarmulkes, you know, mm -hmm. and in the... Uh, uh, Israeli writing. In other words, and I, I asked one of the women after having gone through about, you know, four or five of these offices, I said, because I was pretending like I really, you know, wanted, I was just kind of wanting to know where, where the Palestinian office was, you know. She said, well, we handle all of that. We handle all of that. And this so, is the State Department, the... Near East. The, the part that handles Israel, Jordan, okay. all of these. Egypt? Yeah, yeah. the Near East section. Uh -huh. Yeah. It was just totally dominated by... Totally. Israeli. Totally. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the spokesman, I can't remember his name, he was a, a Zionist, the spokesman for the whole State Department. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that, and I'm not saying that... Matt, uh, Madeleine Albright is doing a bad job because I feel as though being a woman that she is definitely a lot more balanced <coughs> than Weinberger when he was there, Eagleberger, uh, Schultz, or any of them. Uh, because I feel as if she's trying to do it, but she's not strong enough. There needs to be a um, fairness in the State Department, mm -hmm. because all the weapons sales under the table are going to the State Department. That's why Ron Brown was murdered. Ron Brown tried for the first time to take away the unfair st uh, State Department monopoly on illegal weapons and drugs, drug deals. Because the weapons, the, the drug money is paying for the weapons. The, the brand new weapons are sold by agents of, of 
Israel or this. this now, is this is this a conclusion you've drawn based on your knowledge of this? Yeah, Gorbafar, Gorbachar, whatever the guy's name is. Bonifar. Um, Gor yeah. Gorbanifar. Yeah. Gorbanifar, and one of the, it was either he, him, or um, my husband worked with him. Um, my husband was the one who uh, was chief of staff under Al Gray when North was moved from the Atlantic Command to the National Security Council. Ollie North. Ollie North. And when you work in the White House, you work under the Army. They, the Marines have no overlord as such. They, are, um, they can float, they can be truck drivers and still be 4th Marine, but they're run out of New Orleans just like Oswald was. See, Oswald was homosexually recruited by Clay Shaw, David Ferry, that whole, you know, the New Orleans, Meyer Lansky, I don't mean, My, well, Meyer Lansky's guy, uh, Jack Rubenstein, who was Jack Ruby. Um, see, all of the funding for these operations go through the joint, the mob, and Oswald's mother had moved to New York and he had gotten under this Zionist psychiatrist. I can't remember his name. But they, he came down to, to check on him. He was brilliant, but he wasn't motivated. He wasn't told he was special. He, his dad died or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, his father was, was, was a, uh, you know, I believe uh, a German soldier. But the, the point is, Oswald was a loner, brilliant, and a perfect candidate. He and my husband's profile are just, a, in fact, they almost look alike. Hmm. And um, You so mean their profile in terms of their background? Psychological not profile. Not their physical profiles. Yeah, even, even their, they look a lot alike. Hmm. Yeah. And what's interesting is... They always that, allege that uh, he had a double. Well, Couldn't you have see, been your this husband. is interesting. My husband, when I saw him in June, after his having lived with me that fall, he was different, a different facial everything than the man I married. The man I married and the man I saw in June were one and the same. Had a fuller face, mm -hmm. um, the, the mouth, you know, the, the, the mouth was fine, but the, the man that I was with, and it, 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 I know that it, I felt it was not the same person. Now, I don't think he could have gained that much weight in just a few months um, because he was very thin and, you know, it... Now, I, I could be just... Um, but, but women sense things. I, I don't know how to explain it. And I talked to a good friend of Marina Oswald's who... Um, knows that her husband was a patsy. Um, and I talked to another woman in El Paso who was in the book The Widows, whose husband was a, a German, or rather a Czechoslovakian, whose father and two brothers had come over here as mercenaries, like all of these young men are still doing mm -hmm. today. And the father sent for the little boy and his sister, leaving the mother back in Czechoslovakia. Evidently, she had had an affair or something, but she was banished. I think they do this on purpose, though, because I'm finding that the boys identify with their mothers. They don't bond so much with the fathers, and they are their mother's keeper in that country. Now, I've talked to an Indian who had this situation, a, a little boy from um, Haiti and a young boy from Romania. Each and every scenario was the same. The mothers were back there. They were given five years to become an American citizen as they were mercenaries. They had to do things that made one of them cry on the bus. And he told me what, mm. what was done when they did a hit, they did... There was one man who did things that were just horrible, and he said, I want to get out, but I can't. And this is horrible. 
to put young men who are strict Roman Catholics, you know, they've got that, that background, and mm -hmm. bring them over here and make assassins of them, or in other words, to, to turn them in a five-year period, and for the taxpayers to pay for this. These young men are training with SEALs. They may have a, a mother who's an American and a father who's French, um, so they can go both ways. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're not under the, the laws of the United States, so they can go do the actual um, murders or whatever. And Oswald, in Oswald's case, um, if you remember, he was, uh, he didn't have any problem getting into the Soviet Union. Right. And he went into the State Department on a Saturday. The man who saw him was, was a Zionist. He didn't even meet anybody else. Special, elite. Then he went to this town where, um, there were a lot of, um, you know, sort of a, a, an intellig Zionist intelligence elite group. The, the Georgian Russians had, because um, most of the intelligence people for a long time were Zionist mm -hmm. in, in the Soviet Union and in, in Germany. And, and uh, I don't know, but I know that they recruited a lot of boys at Eton and places like that. Um, homosexually in England, um, and then a lot of them went to the Soviet Union uh, after the doctor's plot or something that I think Stalin thought that the Jewish doctors were after him or something. So in 1952, a lot of them had to go away, and uh, they had some sort of a, a change or whatever. But what's interesting is that a lot of this played into Georgia's tied into my husband because he was in the place, the Mecca, for the Jewish intelligence um, or the Zionist intelligence mm -hmm. people in Princeton. All of the movie actors, you know, the uh, movie moguls or whatever, mm -hmm. they started out in Princeton. <coughs> the psychological uh, operations crowd from the Nazi, the um, whatever, they came to Princeton. And, you know, of course, they, some of them went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. and, and they spread out from there, Oppenheimer, and uh, I mean, you know, it's very interesting. That's where a lot of them were in Princeton. And he was there, uh, of course, um, well, I mean, he was born in 37. He lived in, born in Atlantic City, then they moved to Lawrenceville. But his grandparents lived outside of Princeton. So he had a tie with, um, his grandparents, but then his grandparents wound up moving out to California, so he was really abandoned from the time he was 13. And of course, being under the influence of, of um, Charles Caddock, who was the bodyguard for the Saudis, a la teacher. And he controlled the power in the school. Hmm. The Cheeseboro Headmaster Cheeseboro, of course, gave Charles Caddock carte blanche. Why? Because the Saudis bought a big mansion called Russell House. Caddock was there with the Saudis all alone. And my husband was there part of the time. They would go on outings using Saudi money. I mean, my husband was taught to fly a plane. He was taught to shoot. They went on these, they, they would get nude and run in the woods kind of thing. Um, um, even at Princeton, his um, roommates told me that he would go out with these men. And when his first roommate said, because he was, he really likes George, and George is a really handsome, I think, a little older now, but in, in those days he was very handsome. And uh, his roommate, of the first two years and who'd been at the Hun said that um, he had a relationship with a French teacher who was um, a count or whatever from Paris, who was kind of a teacher's aide who helped him write his paper, and who knew uh, Camus, 
In other words, there was a group, this young French teacher, who liked my husband a lot and helped him with, with his thesis, mm -hmm. was also a friend of an older French teacher who was a very good friend of Camus. And Camus was coming over to see him Camus. when he was ma married. Camus is? Albert Camus is uh, an existentialist writer who believed in murder and, you know, um, sabotage. and The end that justifies any means. Yeah, and he was also an Arabist. They were, you see, Lawrence of Arabia, this group stuff was started by this small group of Kabbalists who were trying to take over the oil. So what they would do would be to find these sheiks and, and find whichever <coughs> one would, would go along with whatever. Well, the Brits were more interested in um, finding somebody who was fair, you know, not necessarily like that. You know, they, but then there was a guy named Moose who was in the American State Department who tried to, they, they wound up, um, the Americans wound up poisoning this Caddock, got in with the, the Saudi royal family, the, the older, the other brother, who wound up getting it. They had a, a house in Switzerland. Uh, the Saudi royals had a big, you know, big mansions on the, uh, as Les Rose is the place where Charles Caddock died, I understand. And my husband, according to the roommates, one in particular, who said, George never lost track. He always kept up with Charles Caddock. Well, Charles Caddock only died in, what, 1995, 1994. I only heard of him as a teacher in the first three years of marriage. But when was he writing Charles Caddock? He was writing him, you know, Charles Caddock and, and, and uh, Robinson, um, um, Robinson, I can't think of his name now. Um, you probably will tomorrow. Alexander Robinson. Alexander Robinson. Was a Marine, very handsome, young, went to the Hun school, and was in Saudi Arabia, in these places, came fresh from there to the Hun school. Columbia, went to Columbia University as a history major, which is a, a, an intelligence school. Columbia is a, a school where, um, you know, for example, Nussbaum went, who, who was across the hall from Vince Foster. Um, I believe Ezra Pound went there, but in other words, Ezra Pound knew too much, so they just put him in St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Right. And it was a wonderful Virginian who got him out. You know, in the movie uh, JFK, yeah. There's a scene where it shows uh, this homosexual. You've seen the movie JFK. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. Well, I, I presume yeah. too much, but there was a scene involving a uh, uh, ferry and uh, who's the other guy in New Orleans? That, uh, David Ferry and and um, Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw was OSS. He was also in intelligence, and he was homosexual. Yeah, and uh, they did dress up. They were in that movie. Yeah, in complete drag and a real weird thing. And um, I'm sure that struck a lot of people as it's very odd that these people would be homosexual like that. But that, actually the movie, very... Um, I'll have to see that. Evidently, very frankly, brought that across. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, what's interesting to me is this book, The Widows, um, has four spies, double agents, who work for the United States and Soviet satellites or whatever who um, were murdered. And they worked for the sort of the Navy and the Army. And one of them was a man who was murdered outside of um, the, the Army's uh, intelligence headquarters outside of mm -hmm. Washington and in a Holiday Inn, I think it was. 
And just before he was murdered, he called his wife back in El Paso and said, the army is going to kill me. They're going to kill me. Well, he was murdered, and the army did kill him. Now, this is a fictional account, or this no, really happened? No, it actually happened. Oh, I, I was saying the book The Widows is not fiction, then. Oh, no. It's, it's all... Golitsyn, the spy Golitsyn was in there. Um, there, were, there were a couple of others. Uh, Paisley, who was murdered almost like this other man. In a, he, Paisley was murdered like William Colby. Paisley was also hanging around with homosexuals. He went to the Rush River Lodge. He, that is the one. So did Bob Woodward. Bob Woodward, you know. The reporter? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Henry Kissinger was a well-known, um, totally a homosexual, not even both ways. Um, and so it, his wife is a marriage of uh, Oh, it's just a convenience. convenience. Yeah, and he might, you know, maybe he's discovered women in his late, late age, I don't know. But, um, no, I, I heard through the, the, a very well-grounded German that, that Henry's best friend's father told Henry to stay away from him, and that's why Henry left. The family were embarrassed, and Henry, Henry went to Britain where they did this, and then changed his name from Heinz to Henry. Um, and I interviewed um, a man named Bob, who's uh, an army enlisted person who uh, told me about Henry in Cambodia. So he up through um, Cambodia, he was, he was actually raping young men. And of course, it, that experience destroyed the lives of, of these five young men, according to the source. Mm. I mean, he, he said he was crying, and this man is, was a perfectly wonderful, functioning, young married man who worked for a newspaper on the Eastern Shore and had three young children, went to, to Vietnam as an enlisted man, was put in Cambodia, which he said he was, it was a lie living there, and then ran into Henry Kissinger, or Henry Kissinger ran into him and did certain things to him, invited him into his tent with some other men. It was horrible, but it was, you know, he said it's wartime and um, so forth. But he said, you know, it, I could have taken it mentally if it had been a bunk mate or something. But he said, when it's someone like Henry Kissinger who does it to you, you're ruined. He said, I could never, he said, he came back home. Oh, and this is interesting. And I really believe that, that Bob's right. He said, Kissinger said to him, if you ever tell anybody, if you ever mention a soul, this is the, it's the end of you. Don't you ever tell anybody. Well, when he got back, when Bob got back, um, he went to a special hospital, and they were going to keep him locked up forever. Bob. Bob. A lot of the other boys just, you know, I, my feeling is that, that he was flagged the way I was flagged when General Gray and, you know, Wilhelm had me flagged because I broke up the go-go dancing. Mm -hmm. In the officers club, I was labeled a troublemaker because I thought it was wrong for married men to be going out with with topless go-go dancers in the officers club dining room, and I took pictures of it. And my husband, you know, got really mad and so forth. And these pictures today are still with you, or they're missing? Oh no, my husband. What happened? I had the pictures. Um, I risked my life because he tried to grab the camera from me. I hid it in the women's bathroom, and uh, he tried to get it from me. We had a terrible fight that night. He wanted the pictures, and um, I mean, I prevailed. I developed the pictures, wrote a very nice Southern letter, sent a, the letter, wrote the letter to the uh, club manager saying I didn't think it was proper, sent, the, had, had three sets, actually four sets, the, of, the, of the three photographs I took made, and um, I sent a copy of the letter and the photographs to the base commander's wife and to the commandant's wife, and it stopped. But I, I was flagged, so 
I know, and, but this was before tail hook, and yet instead of being congratulated for helping family values, for standing up for the wives, for showing the Marine Corps the proper place to have nudity and debauchery is not in the dining room of Camp Lejeune. And my husband said, well, if you, this is nothing compared to Okinawa. You just have to get used to it, he told me. Now, I was a colonel's wife. These were young majors, and they were seeing me being talked down to. What do you think it did to them? It demoralized them. The Marine Corps was demoralized. The wives were demoralized, and I did, I did what was right, what Jesus Christ would have done. How can they call themselves Christians and condone? How can Al Gray and, and Wilhelm and Cook and, and my husband condone this kind of behavior and flag me as a weirdo? Mm -hmm. So there's something, and I, that's where I'm standing. I'm standing on on what I know Jesus Christ would have done. And if they want to, uh, you know, continue to hound me because I'm telling truth, well, that's, that's just the way it is because I'm not going to lie and, and develop a different kind of personality just to please them. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, that, that, that happened. Well, it's certainly honorable. Now the, so then the, uh, the book, The Widows, yeah. Uh, continues with... Yes. Uh, yes. And I contacted this woman. There was a detective who had to be hired. She knew he'd been murdered. The Army covered everything up. She uh, had an independent investigator. And the interesting thing which happened was that she worked in a toy shop. This isn't in the book. She mm -hmm. told me this over the phone. This is Mrs. Yeah, uh, his n it's like Klein. Oh, well, anyway. So yeah. Um, anyway, it, he's, he's a, I'll, I'll think of it in a minute, okay. hopefully. But she worked in a toy shop and they were scoping her out. And the, this was just after the, um, no, no, it was before he was murdered. It was before he was murdered because she said she told her husband about this. George Bush and his wife came into her shop and oh. were looking at her. Why? Now, I don't know what that means, but they don't live in El Paso. Why? And he was doing all of the Russian Mexican Trotsky kind of work for George Bush. George Bush. Bush. No, no, this guy. This guy. Was. Yeah. Now this is while Weapon George sales. was CIA director. Right. I believe he. Yes, I believe he was CIA director then. But the interesting thing to me was that why would he scope the wife? Why would he bring Barbara in? You know, did Barbara know? Was he just using Barbara as a, you know, but she was being observed. Mm. And it was shortly before he was murdered. And, and I know that Parker Host, my husband's friend, has dealings with George Bush. So um, I don't know. I know there's a lot to do with oil and Aramco and, um, you know, Texas and, and all of that. Um, I know it's very complex, but where I draw the line is, is murder and assassination and corruption and lies and deception and cruelty to innocent women and children and families just because they're not elite. Mm -hmm. Just because, now, Mrs. Bush is in the Colonial Dames, so is my mother. Colonial but Dames? What colonial is Dames. It's a, uh, Colonial Dames is a very elite group of uh, women, they, they think they are, who are descendants of George Washington's aides. Oh. And they have, they own George Washington's ancestral home. 
uh, Saulgrave Manor in Great Britain. They run, um, Wil they have Wilton in Richmond, which is an old house where Lafayette visited. I know there's a connection with Lafayette and the Masons. And I know there's a big Mason contingent in the Warfare Selling Group, because the head admiral in Norway, um, Igam, no, I think he's, no, 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 not Igam, because he, he was, he's in charge of the prisons which have the drug lord. He's running the drug lord out of his prison, and he's a friend of Georgia's, Newt Igam. They were talking about this as though I, I would know about it, you know. Um, and and he, lived, he has a house or a cottage right outside of Kolsas, Norway, which is where they have their underground, one of their underground bunkers. Hmm. They have one in Narvik, and um, they do a lot of the cold weather training NATO does up there. But um, I know they're doing weapon shipments out of Norway. Okay, we'll call this a wrap for I'm tired. <laughs> you have done a stellar job. Well. You have done a stellar job. Uh, you want to be sure to take all these things. Yeah. If they yeah. would be secure here, but let's not take Well, I, chances. you know, me, I just, this is not in order. Um, but this is interesting because they're talking about having mercenary guys now, like the executive decision or the, these, they're, they're, they're hiring mercenaries, countries are, to, to do, but it's not just countries that are hiring mercenaries, it's, um, you know, others. This is his Princeton yearbook, and, um, you know, what some of the guys are doing this year, which is interesting. Okay. <laughs> okay, now we're on the clock. Um, who have we got here in this picture? All right. Let me just, just put this here. Uh, this individual here is, his, his name now is, is Rockland Williams. He's a South African uh, quote-unquote general who was uh, with the army of the, the white army in South Africa, who was actually a double agent uh, for, the, for Mandela's forces. He's an assassin, a murderer, and... Uh, Did Jasmine tell you of any murders that he committed? Any people or any, any situations? He, he stayed um, there with us. Uh, he was a guest of the State Department, and my husband arranged... This is my husband here. This is... Um, a gal in our church, Carla, whom I thought would be interested in going along with us that day um, because of the South African connection and Mandela and so forth. She's, she's a, another battered um, military wife um, who lost a child. And um, anyway, she uh, is a very bright lady. And uh, we... Now this guy's name again is... Rockland Williams. He studied in Great Britain after this. Does he have any Got a doctorate. Name? Yeah. He uh, is very interested in Ireland. I think he's basically um, sort of part of that IRA kind of underground. Um, but his father, interestingly enough, um, came over to North Carolina as one of the um, sort of underground trainers, uh, trainees or during World War II. They had a, a number of training bases um, for uh, communists okay. in, in this country. And his father trained and lived in North Carolina, but was not from America, which is interesting. All right, now we're on the picture on the right, uh, an individual laying down. That's your husband. Yeah, uh, my husband was a, a rageaholic uh, during Vietnam. He had to kill a number of people and lots and lots of people, and he was suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. And the interesting thing to me is that he cannot control himself when he 
is drinking or e either at odd times, he goes into what's called a berserk state. Okay, so this is one of his cast up stages? Yeah, yeah. And yet he was chief of staff of the... Uh, okay, let's go Yeah, the first picture is um, of, of me and Sarah McClendon and General um, Carl Mundy, who became the Commandant of the Marine Corps after Al Gray, for whom my husband was Chief of Staff. Um, this was at a party at 8th and I Street at the Marine Corps uh, Commandant's house. It was a garden party for the Secretary of Defense. He's a good guy or bad guy? Oh, bad guy. I mean, he knows what's going on and doing nothing about it, ordering hits and um, and where was this taken again? It was in Washington, D.C. at the Marine Corps Commandant's Garden Party in August of 1996. It was a garden party for the Secretary of Defense and the Marine Corps Commandant who, Krulak. Who, who would have taken this picture? Uh, one of the military photographers, but they stole. I had um, at least six pictures of that garden party, uh -huh. and I would because they were coming in my house and stealing pictures. Um, this is the only one I have of, of that, but it's a picture of a picture. Because they didn't want uh, me to, to have any proof that I had been there, but I was there. Okay. Um, this is a picture of my husband's, uh, supposedly his retirement from the Marine Corps, which he, you never retire, according to my husband, from the Marine Corps. You're always um, a mercenary, and uh, you work under the New Orleans 4th Marines, which are under a different kind of law than, than our country. Uh, Napoleonic law is the law of, of Louisiana. And um, my husband was always going down to Louisiana. They have a, a training school for assassins. They kind of hop around from Lake Pontchartrain to here and there. And, uh, this is General Al Gray, who was the commandant of the Marine Corps um, at that time when my husband retired. Uh, my husband was his chief of staff. This is my husband, George Raymond Griggs. Okay, hang on just a second. Let's get, uh, let's get a good shot of Gray here. Okay, who's the guy next to Gray? Uh, this is my husband's son. Uh, he's not this quite one? right. Yeah, he's he's kind of a little bit of a. Um, he's not right. And the lady? That's um, the the commandant's wife. He married her very late in life because he needed a third star. Now, who's the commandant? Al Gray, and and her name is Jan Gray. She is she a good lady? She worked Has for potentials. She has potential. She worked for him in his, in see, even when he was general, there w he ran an intelligence uh, operation, which was a contract organization, trying to hook politicians and get them. Uh, what is the word? In other words, in situation. Yes, yes. He has and still had and still has an organization which um, brings in whores, prostitutes, whatever you want to, want to say, who will compromise politicians so they can be used. Jan worked for him in that organization, which was not part of the military. She was a hooker. Well, Paul, I don't know. She's, she chain smokes, she sleeps with the dogs and stuff. But when his mother was ill, when he was at FMF Lant, Fleet Marine Force Atlantic, yeah. um, Jan came to stay with his mother because she was on sedation and she may have talked too much mm -hmm. uh, to keep an eye on the mother. And then he he married her because he he would not have made um, gotten his third star or whatever without having been married because he is a homosexual. He's a well-known um, group sex homosexual. Okay. Um, and that's my husband, that's me, and that's my son, Garland, who's now married. And I have two grandchildren. This is a copy of my husband's diploma from the NATO Defense College at Rome. 
He was in the 56th course there. Okay, again, this is the... NATO Defense College, which is part of the of, of NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Okay. Um, he also worked for NATO, and I was the head of the, uh, uh, on the board of the NATO Wives Club. This is just, you know, the Norfolk branch of NATO. Some secret papers that he had in the house, of course, he shouldn't have had. Uh, these were operations that were going on, okay. amphibious operations. These are just some landings in Norway and uh, different brigades and names. Okay. This is an original um, of uh, a memorandum from when he was at NATO. Okay. And um, <laughs> this is a funny picture. I just uh, heard about Marshenko was going to be at a book signing, and I kind of was curious to know whether he had even known George and so forth, and he did. And he that's a picture of me with, with Richard Marshenko. And his father was, of course, one of these mercenaries who came to work for our country. And, um, and if you read any of his books, you know that they do everything they want. Uh, there are, there's no right or wrong. And then these guys are churned out. And, um, now this I have um, in here because this is about the royal family of um, Saudi Arabia. And um, my husband was, this is how my husband's gotten his power. Um, because my husband went to a private boys' school on scholarship. He was hooked the same way Oswald was, um, homosexually. Mm -hmm. And the Saudi, the three oldest Saudi boys, were also hooked homosexually. The first one to come over after the uncle had been murdered, because uncle was a really good guy, and he favored the British. So these uh, saboteurs, these communists, who were in when you say uncle, you're not making reference like man from uncle. Right? No, the uncle of, of okay. the Saudi royals. I, I just wanted to say a connection between that uh, television series. And but Mansour was killed. Ma it was Mansour who was, who was poisoned in Paris. Right. Okay. And my husband went to school with him. And now there's one of them involved with the Marine Corps. He's, he's kind of... All right, this is the recruiter for my husband. Um, I'm sorry it's not a better picture, but it was faxed to me, and they took um, the originals. This was a copy of an old one. His name was Charles Caddock, and he was a homosexual. Borland was a homosexual. Okay, I need um, you to hold it up about two inches. There, that's close. Charles Caddock died in the Saudi... Um, one of the Saudi mansions in uh, outside of Marseille where you, they used to have the group sex orgies. It's a place called Es Le Rose. Okay. And, um, okay. okay, I think that's, then, then we get into the diary. What's, what's this here? Oh, yeah, this is um, one of my husband's uh, friends who, whom I talked to about some things that were going on. He was on, on the ship with my husband okay. at Townley. Did you mention any of these during our interviews? Or no, I, don't, I didn't mention okay. Ed Townley, so he's not. Right. Let me see if there's anything here. Um, yeah. Uh, when I was going through, they've taken so many of the originals. Um, I met with Ollie Whipple. Now, Ollie Whipple is another marine intelligence person who um, told me about Dale Dorman. Okay, do we have any pictures? No. All we need to reduce on this tape here is pictures. Okay. Or documents that are significant to anything we might have discussed. Engelhart, uh, my, my husband's getting mail Major for an Engelhart. Joseph Engelhart. And uh, I know that there's a connection. He's just, money's being laundered. Um, this is um, a uh, presidential citation, copy of one from my husband. Okay. Oh, and this number is important because this is not his social security number, and you can find out a lot by that number. I think it's, 
it's either 077 uh, 170 or with that number you can find out a lot about my husband from that oh here it is 077670 oh. these are certificates of what when he rises in rank oh I see from one, one rank to the Major. other Captain. We, we went from colonel all the way back I see he was oh uh, let's see now next step after colonel is uh, general general he didn't make general because of his wife's mishap <laughs> <laughs> yeah <Here's the> <laughs> that kind of put him back a little bit you missed him huh uh, no no I mean his first wife oh, oh. her, her death yeah. which was not here um, he was with the U.S. Defense Liaison Group in Indonesia okay. where they were training assassins on um, t Timor. They have a, a little factory for assassins and terrorists that was started by Mountbatten. Okay. Okay. This is NATO headquarters. Um, oh. These are, these are notes by his, his a Marine Corps friend of his from Princeton um, who uh, was in his class and who helped me a little bit to understand what was going on. But this is interesting in his handwriting because it says, Robertson says Kay has spoken of abuses, George spending up to the limit, 33000 on credit cards. He says an intervention often uh, might, you know, might be good. Uh, J.R., Jim Robertson, is disturbed by Kay's stories, and this is J.R.'s number. Well, who is Jim Robertson now but the head of the Justice Department Criminal Division? And this is in, you know, in his handwriting. They've taken the originals. Um, Mike Kimmel he was mentioned to me by uh, Jim Proctor, who has written this, Mike Kimmel is the son of the famous admiral who was the head of Pearl Harbor at the Pearl Harbor bombing. And my theory is that um, these guys take the sons of generals and then they, they suck them into to their, their little thing. Jack Herman, uh, in the dark. Jack Herman is, was my husband's uh, roommate from Brooklyn, whose father was Barbara Streisand's um, doctor and who is really literally kind of a basket case since he graduated from Princeton. Siegel is the president of the class. Right. John Wilhelm, I think he's related to Charlie Wilhelm, whom my husband's now working for. He's in intelligence. We have a picture of him in the uh, reading. Yeah, we do have a picture of John Wilhelm. Murdered or something happens to me. He's, and I'm really scared when I talk about all right. The, the more you talk about it, the more you talk about it, and the more people know, the more safe you are. This guy, his name is V.W. Wooten. He was a, um, and his son Wallace. He said it was his son. This is the license number ZYF three nine seven seven Chrysler LeBaron Maroon. The time uh, it was five thirty ninety six two o'clock from about two until four thirty in the afternoon. They were parked there, and on his clipboard, he had personal data. He, he had a book entitled Religions of the World. He was obviously studying Islamic religions, because that was, you know, what the thing. Two army pea green coats, his curriculum vita, and he had 21 years of service with the Air Force. Among the top, I couldn't read the rest of that. Experience, 1992 to present. Chief of Security, K.I. Sawyer. Commander of 350 persons, provides protection, top secret security, education, master's degree, bachelor's degree, squadron officer, Air Force Staff College, fundamentals of total, probably total quality, I don't know, awards, air training command, member of the Marquette, he's a fraternal order of police member. But this is interesting, 1991 to 1992, Provost Marshal at Keflavik, Iceland, which is where all of this, the drug smuggling and stuff goes through that, that air, airport. 
staff supervisor of 500 people, brief U.S. ambassador during the visit of the Pope John. He, he okay. was guarding. And this guy again is who? Was uh, guarding my neighborhood. V.W. Wooten? Wooten. All right, this is just a letter from Jim Proctor to Mike Kimmel, who is the son of the famous uh, Admiral, head of um, um, Admiral Kimmel, World War II's, um, you know, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And it says, it seems George has recently disappeared from home for short periods. Um, Kay's trying to talk to everyone she believes who knew George better than average, both in reference to where he might be and in perhaps a more important sense, what makes him tick. Apparently, he, his pattern predates their marriage by quite a lot. She's coming to Washington sometime the week of March the 4th through the 9th, but at a minimum, she would like a call from you. Her number in Virginia Beach is that. I saw your picture in the 35th reunion book sailing off shady side blah 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 and both of these were princeton roommates of my husband okay. this is um from uh the princeton um military rotc book which has the names of the men who were commissioned in the marine corps at the time my husband was there's george raymond griggs and there's jim proctor who's handwriting in letter to the other guy okay all right and, and Tom Lewis, I think, is in there. <coughs> this, these are just more notes. Okay. Um, this is a medical complaint. Uh, when after I was battered and beaten, I tried to get copies of my pictures. They, they wouldn't let me have them. From the medical? Yeah, they, they wouldn't. Um, these are just some little things about... It's not that important. I was just writing down things I remembered. <clears throat> um, I don't think this is really, this is just about some of his background. Um, yeah, no, this is not really, these are just some legal things. Oh, one, yeah. Um, I had so many break-ins in my house, and uh, this was one, and they always had a Marine, 20-year Marine as a police officer, who would interview me and say, oh, well, there's nothing, you know, nothing wrong. You just, you know, you're just imagining things. Well, this particular incident, um, they were SEALs. They were dressed in black. They were amphibious men. My neighborhood is surrounded by water. Mm -hmm. And not only did they break into my house, in my car, they, they were interrupted by a neighbor's dog, a Doberman kind of dog, who chased them, and they left my suitcase in Judge Reed's woods. I guess they were intending to, you know, to get it the next day or something. But the interesting thing is my neighbor, Mrs. Cummings, saw them, and she had been noticing the white van, which I had also been noticing in the neighborhood. And she reported it to the police, and they did nothing about it. And the very day that we had a robbery, she, they had tried to break into her, house because it looks out over my house during the day like the day before and um, she talked to the same police officer and he didn't even tell her there'd been a break-in in my house and they broke not only did they break into my car but they broke into my brother's cars oh you know there are all these houses around but only and they took my brother's um, some of my brother's um, things this is just about what she described to me two weeks before the cars were vandalized. Her, anyway, okay. Okay, that's, this is just describing that. Officer Satterwhite. And I would send things to Jewel McGee. Um, these are just... I had a lot of things going on in my house where they were they were doing things. Oh yeah, this is um, from the alumni list of Princeton, and I don't have the, the. In other words, the Saudi Royals are in the alumni class list, but they're not in in this particular one. But um, if you call the Hun School and you get a list of the alumni. 
then you um, will find the Saudis are there. Um, now this, the CFR list, this is why I have, have this. This is the CFR, Council of Foreign Relationship Members. And all of these I've, I've heard about or, or met some of them. My husband's mentioned. Um, there's some that are also skull and bones at the same time. It's the Yale leadership crowd. Howard Baker, George Ball, uh, Steve Bell I know really well. He, he is a friend of my former uh, husband's family. Do we, Tom did we mention him in the interview at all? Steve Bell? No. John Blum we did mention. Um, my son is married to his daughter. John Blum, uh, he's a uh, Brooklyn, uh, Yaley, he's, um, he's, I know, he's, his best friend is this Rockefeller guy, um, not but Jay. His son is married to your daughter. No, his daughter is his married son. to my son. His daughter is married to you. And son. they met, he, his father, they're, they're Jewish, you know, part Jewish. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting to me is that, um, See, I married the governor's grandson, and my son is John Garland Pollard the fourth. I mean, you know, you're talking old Virginia. Mm -hmm. kind of, I, I was like a brooding mare for, for them. I mean, you know, I was a bird of Virginia. It was kind of like, you know, you marry this, this John Garland Pollard. Well, my son went to Woodbury Forest, which is where George Bush's son went and Oliver North's son went. Okay. My son went there for four years. And he met Alice Blum, who, you know, they have a place in Maine, a place. And um, there's a lot I know about John Blum, but I didn't mention that. I mean, there's so much. John Brokaw's name is John Brokaw, um, Califano, Jimmy Carter, Chafee, Bill Clinton, Cisneros, Cheney, so forth. Oh, Harding, Harding Carter is a real close personal friend of my husband's and a Princeton graduate. Okay, look this up to me. Yeah. There we go. Oh. Harding Carter. Okay, Harding Carter. And so is Carter. William Crow. And who is he? He's a, a Princeton classmate of my husband's who uh, was um, what does in he the do? Carter administration, intelligence. All, all mostly intelligence. And they're not intelligent. Michael Dukakis, Andrew Biddle Duke. Larry Eagleburger, he and Henry Kissinger were good friends. Einhorn, oh, no, I didn't mention him, so I won't. Okay. Forrestal, he's the son of James Forrestal, who was murdered. Okay. Alan Frost, I know her. Firestone, Gelb, David Bergen. Anybody you might have mentioned in the tapes. Let's see, I'll go real quick. I may have mentioned David Hoops, but I don't think so. Okay. These are just CFR people. Yeah. Henry Kissinger. Yeah. Oh, another good friend of my husband's is Cord Meyer and Bob McFarlane, really good friend of my husband. Paratro, real good friend of George's. Uh, the Pincus family. Oh, Consuela Rice, she's a good friend of my husband's. Uh, the Rostos. All, all four of the Rostos. Yeah, these are bad guys. Major, major bad guys. David Rockefeller is a friend of my my son's. Um, he, he came to my son's wedding. David Rockefeller? Mm -hmm. In Connecticut. He was in Connecticut. Mm. George Schultz, really good friend of, of George's and, and everybody. He's, he's a big power guy. He's, he knows a lot. He's the one who went to Clinton's and told Clinton not to run, that he, they were going to get him. Yeah. And had a meeting, and Clinton threw something at him and stuff. Call Sarah McClendon. Sarah was full of that story for a number of days. Harry Train lives at the beach, and he's, um, I know him very well. He's part of the New World Order crowd, former. Strobe Talbot, another good friend of my husband's, really good friend. David Stockman. Dave Stockman, he's a Michigan boy. Oh. Casper Weinberger, Cap Weinberger. That's it. What about Stan? Oh, Casimir Yost. I mentioned him. I'm sure that's Mary Clark Yost's son. I'm sure. Yeah. I, I know it. Okay. Do you know Do you know Mary Clark? 
Okay. That, that, um, this, this I think is interesting. This, this is a, an intelligence and electronic warfare operations book distributed by the Army. And what, what it shows me is how um, arrogant they are about subversion and, and deception. In other words, this is, this is just a regular old field manual, you know, 1983 or whatever. And um, deception is, is so important. Um, and deep operations, deep cover. Uh, now, they don't have the hey, word. Open that up again where it says deep cover. I'm going to take a shot of that. Okay. The, um, in the special operations is what my husband was head of operations. Um, the electronic warfare, um, an important part of electronic warfare is deception and knowing everything about the person. Not just knowing about the target. Now, human beings are called targets. Women now are being targeted by the military. Right. Wives like me. So <coughs> they'll have a team finding out everything about my grandparents, my family, uh, you know, who my friends are, to try and discredit me. And of course, everybody who is flagged, who is a target, well, jam, jamming is a deliberate <coughs> radiation or re-radiation of electromagnetic energy to prevent or downgrade the reception of information by a receiver. The um, multi-spot jamming is directed against more than one frequency. Uh, in other words, they jam the, I've had my, down, my car ID downloaded. Uh, Sarah McClendon called my house and was told she couldn't reach me. It was a military base. Um, MED is conducted. MED is manipulat manipulative electronic deception. Uh, simulated, simulative electronic de deception is SED. MED is conducted by altering the electromagnetic profile of friendly forces. It seeks to counter hostile electronic warfare and signet activities by manipulating friendly electronic magnetic emissions. This is done by magnifying the technical characteristics and profiles which would provide an accurate picture of friendly intentions by deliberately transmitting false information. Um, in other words, they are um, interested in um, deception as, as part of their, their um, you know, line of attack. Okay. Cool. Okay. <coughs> it, it's just it, it just goes on and on and on. <coughs> well, it, it authenticates it. <coughs> they teach this stuff. Yeah. Uh, there's been no single pictures yet. Oh, yeah. snaps. Oh. Real handsome guy. Uh, his his dad was a Nazi soldier. Okay, was with the the big you know elite. Name is Ken Millis. Let's see. And that's his uh, mother, Flo, from Seven Mile, Ohio. Really nice. All right. That's that former Ish. Marine Chief of Staff. While my husband's wife was <laughs> being put in the grave. Let me zero in here again a little bit here. These are some original letters that he wrote to his lady friend when he was married to his first wife. Okay, now, now once again, these, uh, the significance here... Is he is a Marine colonel who uh, was always there when George would sort of disappear, but he was chief of staff 
Okay. Um, and the ladies are? His wife and his mother and my husband and, and me. Okay. Okay. Uh, whoops, whoops. Oh, I'm sorry. Pictures. Sorry. Um, okay, the other one shows uh, that you're actually human. Yeah. Dog lover. Yeah. Princeton Ashtray. And who's in the picture above? That's uh, his first wife's mother and his, um, his daughter and his daughter-in-law with the baby that I just prayed that it would be a granddaughter. And um, this is Melinda, little Melinda, in front of the dollhouse in our yard. Hmm. Okay. Okay. This is his first wife. Can't tell you what. With a dog. Let's hold this right about, oh, I don't know. Let me put something up this so we can be on. How about this? Here we go. There we go. Just lay them on top of that. All right. I never knew Sue. That's his first wife. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. Yep. This is George and his cousin Bob. They're big drinkers in that family. I don't know who the other people are. Okay. This is George in, in one of his rages. This is in the morning too, without without I alcohol. Gotta, <laughs> I gotta back up in order to get it focused. Back up to the uh, the raging one, the okay. one we did before. Okay. I mean, I'm scared. You, you're talking you're talking major injuries I've had, broken bones. Um, and I reach out for help, and then I become the target. So you're taking a picture while this rage is going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, at risk of my where, life. Was he where you were taking the photo? He, uh, he's in a total, <coughs> unbelievable state. Okay, next. It's called the bizarre, berserk state. This is just, you know, when he he's walks around nude, when he gets in these stages. Okay. Can't help. I mean, I don't know. I, I can't, I just don't know how to. This is him again. He'd take a lot of the pictures and cameras. I'd, he'd break cameras. Because I was trying to get some, somebody to help mm -hmm. me protect my life. Just just get some help. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all. I wasn't trying to tell on him or, you know, be, be a bad... I was just trying to get some help. And I was scared. I mean, th this is the normal look. Um, he, he has the look of someone's a little deranged. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just a wee bit. This, I mean, this, this is a guy working now for Wilhelm in Florida. I mean, giving secrets away, that, that's the least of the thing. You know. This is mother and former mother-in-law and me, Cody. Here he is in his bedroom. Okay, now, his particular state of mind here is what? He's, he looks a little defiant. You know, I mean, what's he doing? It's fine if he's a nudist, but I, I mean, I didn't know that. He didn't say, I, I like, I'm a nudist. You know, it's just, it's like I was married to a stranger. This is the George that I, I thought I knew. Okay, I'll tell you what, on that picture there. You know that little rule of thirds I told you about? Yeah. <laughs> Whoever took that picture did not know about it. Oh, right. They have, them on, have you on the bottom third, <laughs> not the upper third. Um, where was this taken? Um, at the Norwegian Lady statue. Okay. And this had to do, uh, they gave me a, a Norwegian Viking ship that day. That was just, that was a port master of Moss, Norway, George. Okay. Happy, happy George. This is another, you know, I think we have that one. Oh, let's do a Happy George, too. Yeah, let's do Happy George. This is this is George on uh, Melissa's boat with his little Princeton hat, and uh, we're going out in the boat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this is, again, the one on the, when he was just, he wouldn't eat for two days, you know. Just Passed out, okay. Yeah. 
this is him in the yard. He'd, he'd do that nude in the yard, you know. He, it was just so, well. Bizarre. Yeah. Now, he had the menage a trois, menage a quatre, with this couple. Um, this is his wife, Sue, who's with Jim Earl, and this is Nancy Earl and George. Uh -huh. And they would do the, the group sex, you know, the, the swinging or whatever you call it. And I had lots of people tell me that, and yet he's, you know, very trusted, and they know everything kind of about him. This is um, another woman he was sleeping with in Beirut, whose husband was the assistant director at the American University of Beirut, who was an Arab. Um, she was an intelligence guy, person. And her son is Kashmir. Okay. This is just, you know, some bruises of me. That's not very nice to look at. There are injuries. This is George with his booze. <laughs> Let's see it. But he looks like a little happier George. Oh, he's always smiling when he's drinking. <laughs> Bless his heart. You know, he's always smiling. Okay. I'm trying to... Uh, oh, this, this was a secretary in Indonesia that, and I know this is kind of terrible, but he and Anne Bouchou's husband and George, they would all sleep together. He went to visit her parents in Australia. Um, and he told, you know, he told me about that. Now, this is Louis Buell, the famous general, who was the one who was going to get him, you know, he was going to be a, a general, but Louis died too soon. There's Louis again. Um, here's Halab's address. You can tell that, you know, he tore it up. <laughs> but I went and retrieved it. There's Halab and company. Halab. Uh, Halab. And these are just some letters to Anne Bouchou, another person. Uh, that's basically it, I think. I think we've got all of it. Okay. That's it. All right, then any other photos you... Yeah, when would that have been? Oh, 93, somewhere around in there. 94. November. Hang on a second, don't move it. Okay. is Mr. T. Parker Hose, <laughs> Burma assassin, <laughs> friend of my husband's, um, owned one shipping agency when he met my husband, knew he was a friend of George Bush's, wound up with eight or nine. Mm -hmm. Changed from being a Democrat to a Republican to introducing George Bush in 96 when he came to speak to an, uh, a banquet that he arranged for ostensibly for John Warner. But when, you know, they did a fundraising thing, you know, you meet George Bush and Barbara, pay a thousand bucks or five hundred bucks. Well, he, he's a mover and shaker um, and a nudist and a, and a group sex guy. Mm -hmm. His sons are real messed up. But he's my husband's best buddy. That's it. That's George's. And that's at his farm. And we would go to the farm and George and Parker would go out on the boat for two and three hours. And I thought, what is going on out there, you know? Um, okay. Here's, here's a little thing about T. Parker Host became chairman of T. Parker Host Incorporated. David Weibel. You know, that's just Parker. Okay. This is his wife, Anne, and I introduced him to her. <sighs> Good work. Her. She's my school friend, you know. Is she still married to him? Yeah. I mean, he's loaded. You know, she she wants a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Her her uncle is um, one of the guys who went to the moon, Collins. Her grandfather was this big army general. So Parker's, I didn't know Anne was all that well connected to the army. Her, her uncle was head of the army's big, um, after he retired, library or you know, their records, yeah. and her 
grandfather, Lawton Collins, was the head of Vietnam before, you know, I mean, you're talking major, if you're Army, interested in the Army. Mm -hmm. So I introduced her to Parker, and he was just a little, <coughs> a little, anyway. What's the next one? Okay. George and, and the, the Earls. Oh, uh, that's the swap. The swap. Swap team. Mm -hmm. Swap and team. That, that, that within that picture, uh, each maid is swapped. Yeah, exactly. She's not standing behind her husband. Oh, no. No, okay. and they're not sitting with each other either. They sit mm -hmm. on top of the other's lap. Yeah. Now, this is a Norwegian couple. No, you don't need to see that. Oh, this is the way he left the kitchen yeah. uh, when he took off. Okay. That's his beer machine there, by the way. Okay, this is just us at a wedding. Oh, yeah, that's a nice picture. Okay. Validates the fact you... Spend time together. Oh, yeah. And yeah. there's even a date in this particular photo. Mm -hmm. 94, 10, 15, 94. Let's see. This is a little good here. This gives a summary of his background. You might need a copy of that. This is his whole, it's not really, doesn't go into the operations and so forth, killing operations. You know, when he was in Jakarta and Naples and Shea okay. and Beirut. Next page. Uh -huh. That's it. Good. I think that's all. All right, and when you get back to Northville, any more photos you can find of any kind, here's what right. I would suggest you do. Go to Kinko's mm -hmm. and just arrange them. You know, like if they're little ones, just arrange them so they fill up with eight and a half on them sheet. Right. Have them make copies of that. And then you could cut those out, flip them over, and explain on what, the they, what they are. All right. Fire them off in the mail immediately. Okay, will do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I feel better having it down somewhere, you know. I mean, I've got some things.